order. I uh, call this meeting to order. This is the Standing Committee on Human Resources. Uh, my name is Chris Palmer, MLA for Kings West and the chair of this committee. So yeah, call order and look at that. That's, just, that's how much power there is there, no. Um, so today, in addition to reviewing appointments to agencies, boards and commissions, we will hear from witnesses regarding skilled labor shortages and impact on critical infrastructure in Nova Scotia. So at this point, I'd like to ask everybody to please put your phones on silent um, as we proceed into our meeting. And I would now ask all committee members to introduce themselves for the record by stating their name and their constituency, starting with uh, Ms. Sheehy Richard. Good morning. Welcome, Mel Melissa Sheehy Richard, MLA for Hans West. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, Dave Ritzy, MLA for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, and Salmon River. Good morning, Johnny McDonald, MLA for Hans East. Good morning, everybody. Nolan Young, MLA for Shelburne. Good morning, everyone. My name is Susie Hansen, and I'm the MLA for Halifax Needham. Hi, Gary Burrell, Halifax Shabucto. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Braden Clark, MLA for Bedford South. Good morning, and welcome, everyone. Tony Ants, MLA for Coal Harbor. Thank you, everyone. And for the purposes of Hansard, I'd also like to recognize the presence of uh, Legislative Council Gordon Hebb to my right and Legislative Committee Clerk Judy Kavanaugh to my left. So at this point, we'd like to uh, ask our witnesses to uh, just have a bit of uh, patience with us as we just proceed with a bit of business we have to do. We're going to move on to uh, appointments for agencies, boards, and commissions at this time. And, uh, and I'd like to ask for a uh, motion for uh, our boards. So uh, MLA McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the Department of Advanced Education, I move to recommend that Nick Bion and Shailen Sparks be appointed members of the Dr. P. Anthony Johnston Memorial Scholarship Committee. There's a motion on the table. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion passed. Emily McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the Department of Education, I move to recommend that Margaret Gillespie de Goyer be appointed member of University St. Anne Board of Governors. Motion on the table, any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion passed. MLA McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the Department of Community Services, I move to recommend that Colette Robert O'Flake Owaje, I apologize for if I'm, Ronan Banerjee, Veronica Mayfield, Alyssa Bias, Betty McDonald, Brittany Carter, Diane Brothers, and Julia Chinetto, thank you, be appointed members of the Advisory Council of Status of Women. So there's a motion on the table. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion carried. Emily McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And lastly, for the Department of Service, Nova Scotia and Internal Service, I move to recommend that Denise Robichaud be appointed member, funeral director of the Board of Register of Embalmers and Funeral Directors. Motion on the table. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion is carried. So thank you very much. And uh, as you notice, there is a bit of noise here uh, externally around the construction, so we ask for your patience as we proceed through our meeting today. Um, we will ask uh, our committee members to uh, move our, the rest of our committee business to the uh, end of the meeting to allow for uh, a full discussion with our witnesses here today. Uh, so we'd like to welcome all of our witnesses, uh, and I'd, at this point I'd like to ask you all to introduce yourselves uh, at the table, I guess, and we'll uh, begin with Deputy Zappale. So please just intro introduction. Good morning, everyone. Ava Zappoli. I'm the Deputy Minister for Labour, Skills and Immigration. Good morning, everyone. I'm Peter Hackett, the Deputy Minister for Public Works. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Don Bureau, and I'm the President of the Nova Scotia Community College. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jill Provo, and I'm Vice President, Academic and Equity at Nova Scotia Community College. Good morning, everyone. Trent Sold. I'm the incoming chair for the Apprenticeship Board and the executive director for the Nova Scotia Construction Sector Council. Thank you all. So at, at this point, I'd like to ask uh, all those who have prepared remarks to, uh, as an introduction, if you'd like to begin, uh, beginning with Deputy Zappale. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning. 
I'm Ava Zaple, as I mentioned, Deputy Minister for Labour, Skills and Immigration. Thank you for inviting me to be here today, along with colleagues from the Department of Public Works, the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency, and the Nova Scotia Community College. We all play an important role in growing and fostering Nova Scotia's workforce. This is key to building on the growth we're seeing across the province and addressing skilled labour shortages that all jurisdictions across Canada are facing right now. In preparing to come here today, I reflected on something a friend said to me earlier this year. 2030 came early. For many years, it was recognized that many people retiring and people not pursuing certain skilled trades, that by 2030, there would be gaps in our skilled trades sector. COVID accelerated this challenge. Global events have created job pressures, not only in Nova Scotia's labor market, but worldwide. Nova Scotia is in a fierce competition a competition to attract the world's most talented and skilled workers. But I believe Nova Scotia has a competitive advantage. People across the country and all over the world are seeing what Nova Scotia has to offer. They want to come to Nova Scotia, build their careers, lay down roots and thrive here. Since hitting our population milestone of 1 million people in December of 2021, Nova Scotia has welcomed approximately 35,000 more people according to Statistics Canada's population clock. And we have committed to grow our population to 2 million people by 2060. The Department of Labour, Skills and Immigration is laser focused on making sure this growth is both targeted and strategic. We need to attract and retain people who can help us grow our infrastructure and services to support our growing population. We're working with government departments to plan for this growth. Our population will continue to grow with job-ready newcomers arriving daily. And our province's median age is getting younger. Young people will choose to stay here and work, and many who already live here will have opportunities to reskill re and upskill into a trade. The Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency continues to find solutions to grow a strong, diverse, equitable, and highly skilled workforce. We want everyone to know that there is a place for them in the skilled trades. That's why we're focused on making sure we reduce barriers for equity deserving groups. We're attracting job ready newcomers through our immigration streams and from other parts of Canada. We also need to retain our youth, the builders of tomorrow, and show them that a career in the skilled trades has a lot to offer. And we've recently increased the number of apprentices being trained to by journey persons to a ratio of two to one to train more skilled tradespeople faster. We're growing and with growth comes incredible opportunities to promote the skilled trades as a rewarding and viable career path. To address skilled labour shortages, we must make it easier for people to build their skills. We're working with the Nova Scotia Community College to allow easier access to upskilling. We're also here to help employers. We have the tools to help their employees enhance their knowledge and abilities. For example, we have focused on workforce training and business development, increasing diversity in the workplace and strengthening Nova Scotia's economic prospects in Cape Breton. In support of recent infrastructure projects in Cape Breton, we've invested over $1 million in training opportunities. This will help people in the construction sector get the skills they need to work on the new projects in Cape Breton. This also supports industry partners in meeting their labour market needs. Under the Cape Breton Infrastructure Initiative, various targets were set. 25% of trade hours must be worked by apprentices, and 10% of those hours must be uh, worked by apprentices from equity-deserving groups. Also included are provisions for equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion in the entire workforce. At Labour, Skills and Immigration, we're focused on attaching people to jobs and jobs to people. For those looking to attach to the workforce, there are more than 50 Nova Scotia work centres that deliver employment and career services throughout the province. No matter where people find themselves in life or in the job search process, there are passionate staff in every region who can help connect people to work. In recent months, the committee has heard about our marketing campaign that's out right now in other parts of Canada to attract skilled trades workers. The campaign promotes Nova Scotia's more opportunity for skilled trades, goes by the acronym MOST, tax refund for skilled trades workers who are under the age of 30. From the website liveinnovascotia.com, people can connect with our six navigators. They work with newcomers to help them understand what kinds of work opportunities exist in different regions throughout Nova Scotia. 
These are just a few examples of investments, initiatives, and partnerships that are helping us attract, retain, and support the people we need. People that can help build the houses and the infrastructure we need. More people make us stronger in every way. And when it comes to addressing our labour and infrastructure needs in Nova Scotia, people are part of our plan. Thank you for your time, and we're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Deputy Zabale. Uh, Deputy Minister Hackett, do you have any opening comments? I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me here today. Uh, as I said before, I'm Peter Hackett, the Deputy Minister for Public Works for the province. Uh, with me today, I have Mark Peachy, our Chief Engineer of uh, Highways and Transportation, and Gerard Jessam, our Chief Executive Engineering, and looks after our building and vertical infrastructure. Along with thousands of people at Public Works, much of the work we do centers on buildings and maintaining critical infrastructure for Nova Scotians that they count on each and every day. This includes healthcare infrastructure, highways, roads, bridges, schools, and many more to uh, help our, uh, our client departments. The list of priorities for our province is long. It's only going to get longer as our population grows towards our goal of having 2 million people by 2060. In many ways, having this much construction and development underway is a good problem to have. Uh, tens of, but tens of, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people are needed to complete these projects as we go forward. Skilled trades no longer need to look down the road for work. They can find it right here uh, with, the, with the developments that we currently have going on. The billions of dollars invested in these projects help to keep our economy growing through the pandemic and they'll continue to mean opportunities for local businesses as we continue into the future. The challenge with a, with, uh, a local growing economy is finding enough right people at the right time to do this work uh, that we're currently in. If every developer wants to pour concrete at the same time, that is a bit of a problem right now. And, uh, but we also uh, need to work closely with the industry to plan carefully and find so creative solutions to get through this uh, hiccup we're currently under. Labour pressures and rising labour costs are only part of the complex puzzle for major infrastructure projects. Other issues include the cost of availability of materials, rising interest rates, inflation, availability of equipment and other factors that go along with the construction industry. Sometimes it's not about finding enough uh, equipment operators, uh, but just to finding enough equipment uh, to actually bring it to the, to the province to do the work. Uh, this is re the reality of a global market condition of today. It's not just here in Nova Scotia, it's right across the country and in North America, and probably the rest of the, the developed world. Nova Scotia is not alone. Jurisdictions around the world are competing for labour and raw materials to meet increasing demand. Uh, in previous discussions I've had up to this meeting uh, with my counterparts across the country, everybody's continuing to spend. Capital programs are still going on. Everybody still has growing population, decreasing in, uh, uh, in old infrastructure. Uh, so everyone is still spending money right across the country. Uh, there is simply no way for us to outbid our competition. So we have to kind of find solutions to work with it. In many ways, this is a new experience for Nova Scotia. We're not used to this type of demand and this type of progress and this type of work that we're currently under. Um, obviously, a, a good thing. Uh, construction is a good thing and progress forward is a good thing. We just have to find ways to develop around it. We're seeing the convergence of significant population growth combined with major capital investments at a time when resources are in short supply. However, we have faced difficult economic times before or economic times and, and uh, that's one of the responsibilities of the department is to manage risk and to get around that. Our experiences tell us that Nova Scotians are getting good value for their investment and our working relationship with industry helps our province overcome these challenges. As our population demand for major projects continues to grow, we will continue to find solutions that deliver for Nova Scotians. And we're welcome to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Hackett. Uh, Mr. Bureau, do you have any opening comments today? You, Mr. Chair, and again, I want to echo my colleagues' comments and thank you. It's an honour to be here this morning. And I want to thank many of you for spending time on our new campus in Sydney last Friday. I'm here, I'm joined today with my colleague, as was introduced, Jill Provo, who is our Vice President of Academic, and behind me is Tom Gunn, our Dean of Trades and Transportation. Um, as was mentioned already, we're seeing this situation not only across Nova Scotia, but across the country. Um, job vacancies, labour shortages in the construction industry is truly an area of concern. And we know that the employment numbers have returned to pre-pandemic numbers, but we also know that those numbers, those levels are simply not enough. What we've also known for many years now is that one of the main drivers of our shortage in this particular sector is an aging workforce. And close to 20% of construction workers in Atlantic Canada are set to retire by the year 2027 in, in, in four short years. 
We simply, as was mentioned, do not have enough people for the, for the jobs of the future. And we at the Nova Scotia Community College, in addition to the programming that we do, have committed to four large areas of focus. The first, working very closely with Deputy Zappale on establishing strategies to boost immigration. Number two is getting more youth to consider a future career in trades with pride. Number three is creating unique pathways for underrepresented individuals who have traditionally faced barriers of entering this line of work. And last but not least, providing opportunities for quick and sharp and faster upskilling of those already in the industry. Now here's the great news. The great news is that the people that are here today, I can say without a doubt, we spend our time coming up with ways to work more collaboratively. I can guarantee you that we work in a way that's in a partnership focus, but there's more that we can do. If we continue to strengthen our current collaborative efforts, which we're focused on, I am convinced we can reach the goals that are established for this province, the big, the bold, and the brave goal of doubling our population, as was mentioned earlier. To do that, we must continue to work in a strategic, coordinated manner, a manner that is informed by the unique needs, the contributions, and the barriers faced by each of our communities and groups that we serve. Now, let me tell you what we're seeing in particular at NSCC. Some construction programs that we teach um, have very high industry demand. We know there are lots of jobs out there but they're not full. And conversely, we see less industry demand for some programs, graduates, but we have large wait lists for those programs. If we were to grow the capacity and make upgrades for our technology, our spaces, and to increase our, our equipment in many of our trade programs, we would, have, we would need to know and look at the massive investment that that would require. We're also seeing emerging demands that require us to recon reconsider how we best prepare people for the workforce of tomorrow in the light of the expectations of learners today. We know that short, quick courses to cultivate a particular skill that employers want are in high demand globally. The term for this is a term I'm sure you've heard is the term micro-credentials. And they bridge between pre-existing skills that people have today and the knowledge that they require for tomorrow. We offer some of these micro-credentials right now, but we know we need to offer many more. And to do so, we're gonna to continue to work with our friends at the Apprenticeship Agency to make sure that that flow of skilled tradespeople for tomorrow is a clear pathway. And I'm very excited about the work that we're doing now. We also recognize that students coming to us across all programs are in greater need of support when it comes to mental health and readiness for learning at the post-secondary post level. <coughs> We want to make sure at NSCC we foster a culture that prioritizes the mental health and wellness of all students and all employees, allowing them to learn, to grow, to contribute, and to thrive. We're also very intentional, and it's a, it's a unique position in which Jill occupies, which is a Vice President of Academic and Equity. Those two uh, drivers are very important for us to be combined in, in Jill's portfolio. Um, we build diversity as one of our core strengths, and we know that as, as in, by embracing diversity of knowledge, a broader, wider view, world view, and, and experience, those are key drivers for success in advancing education, innovation, creativity, and excellence. Now, we feel that there's a number of programs that we've offered that we can replicate. For example, the Pathways to Shipbuilding program. Uh, through this approach, we can strengthen the Nova Scotia's construction workforce by ensuring equitable opportunities for those who are traditionally underrepresented, allowing them to enter this line of work to truly make their mark. And finally, we believe it's time to foster a wide, to foster widespread, and I see this all the time, widespread pride in this particular line of work and promote a better appreciation of the skills required and the significance of these professions and the talent of those working throughout the industry. Through our annual studies, we know that the satisfaction rate among our grads from all trades-focused programs is very strong, as, to, uh, as is retention. In fact, 94% of our School of Trades and Transportation grads are, who are employed are living and working in Nova Scotia. So Mr. Chair and to your colleagues, I'm very proud that we are here today to speak about this very important topic of labor shortages and its impact on the critical infrastructure of Nova Scotia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bureau. Um, I understand, Ms. Provo, that uh, Mr. Bureau was gave your opening remarks for the uh, 
Community College. So we will um, skip over to Mr. Soholt for opening remarks. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the committee for the opportunity to, to present to you today. And to my esteemed colleagues, I very much appreciate the chance to share with you some insight from industry and from the apprenticeship agency. Uh, we, the province, industry and the apprentice, we, the province, the industries and the apprenticeship agency and the construction sector, we're in a unique time right now. One that is more complex than ever and a complexity that does apply to all sectors in our province. Especially around the, the discussion of labor and the future of work. We can't ignore, though, what has happened the past three years and the impact that that's having on our employers and our labor organizations. The term labor shortage carries a lot of weight, and it's a term that is used too often, I think, and dates right back to the 90s. Um, in some occupations, absolutely, we have a shortage of people pursuing training and pursuing the opportunities for work right ahead of us. In other areas, depending on what stage a project is at, though, we have people who are waiting to go to work or looking for training opportunities. We're noticing that labor in, in construction in particular is more fluid and adaptable than ever. We have workers in the province who still travel to other parts of Canada for work for better wages. We have workers uh, who are drawn into other sectors for better wages. And we also have workers who are, are looking for their own work-life balance and as a result of the past three years are asking themselves some pretty tough questions. Our EI numbers tell part of the story as a legging indicator, but they don't tell the whole picture. We have equity deserving communities who have high unemployment rates, and they have shared with us that when they hear the term labor shortage and industry is not engaging them, they hear industry doesn't want us, and we can't be doing that. This is why we say it's complex. This is why it's important to understand these dynamics. It's often, a fr we often use phrases like labor alignment or skills gap, recruitment or retention challenges. Uh, intentional workforce planning because management, employers, labor, apprentices, students, community le leaders, and, and youth, they share with us their experiences. And keep in mind the private sector is, is competitive in nature and when it comes to skilled labor and the work available, we compete for that labor with every other sector in the province. And to echo Deputy Hackett's comments around supply chain, that's another complication that adds to this, to this nuance, this complexity within our sector. What I would like to share though is the sector will continue to grow and we will adapt. So what do we do to make sure our critical infrastructure uh, gets built? I can share with you confidently, nobody in the construction industry has said we can't do it. Okay. Industry, management and labor, government, community, training providers must communicate and partner and cooperate with a common vision in mind. And this is where sector councils help as our focus is on workforce development. We need to start by understanding the work and in partnership with Build Nova Scotia, Public Works, Industry, Labor Skills and Immigration and the agency, we've built a forecasting tool that can look at our infrastructure projects and calculate the occupations we're gonna need for these major infrastructure investments. How those projects are procured is critical, the requirement for apprenticeship and the inclusion of diversity as part of these projects like the ones in Cape Breton has the rest of the country looking to Nova Scotia as a leader in this space, doing things differently. We need to promote the opportunities and share with our communities, increase career awareness and promote occupations that people don't know about, as, as, as President Bureau mentioned. While recognizing that apprenticeship is important and celebrating our professional builders and even referring to them as trades professionals, that will help attract individuals to our space. In partnership, we need to actively recruit uh, throughout Nova Scotia, throughout Canada and internationally and encourage more people to move here. And I'm pleased to share that last year, our, our council engaged over 700 individuals within the province and had 200 attract to the labor force within the last year. It's doable and there is appetite for that. Uh, retention through consistent meaningful work, training and advancement will be key. We need to provide innovative training that can come through the community college. We have industry partners who provide some of that training as well to meet the needs of these projects and I'm pleased to share that this is happening and those graduates are attaching to the labor force. We simply need more of it. I heard a fantastic statement last week. Um, workforce development is economic development. And I thought that really hit home for a council that spends time in workforce development. In partnership with industry, government, training providers, and our commu communities, it's critical. And a lot of this work is being led by the apprenticeship agency and our industry councils, association, and training partners. As we look forward, I've never been more optimistic about the future of this province as I am today, our opportunities, and yes, our challenges. Thank you very much, and I welcome any questions. 
thank you all for your opening comments. I'm sure we're going to have a great discussion this afternoon. And uh, we'll now move into the question and answer period as per the uh, protocol of this committee. It's uh, done by show of hands. Uh, so I'll do my best to keep a, a running record of uh, who will be asking the questions. I'd like to ask, remind everybody to please uh, Wait till you're uh, recognized by the chair before you begin to speak, just for answered uh, to do the recording. But uh, so we will move into the question and answer period, and we will probably go till 11:40 to allow for closing remarks and uh, any work committee business we have to do. So I see committee members have their hands up, ready to go quickly. So I did see MLA Hansen, and then MLA Young, and then MLA Clark after that. So MLA Hansen, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm always excited to ask questions. So um, this is to Labor, NSCC, and Apprentice, and the Apprenticeship Agency, um, and whoever would like to speak first would go ahead. Um, so we all know that there's a housing crisis in Nova Scotia. It's not a secret. And some of the worst vacancy rates in the areas outside of, Hal uh, outside of Halifax in places like South Shore, Kings, and Hance County. Across the province, we have seen the impacts of the pandemic on people's ability to find, an, to find affordable housing. We we have heard from employers that access to affordable housing is a key barrier to recruiting and retaining workers. The CMHC rental report released last week said that unaffordable rents are contributing to out-migration. It pointed out that the number of people leaving Nova Scotia for other provinces increased by 33% compared to the previous year. A majority of out migrants, 53%, left for more affordable provinces. So my question is, can you explain the impacts of the housing shortage on our ability to recruit and retain skilled workers? Uh, Deputy Zappoli. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so perhaps, it, uh, Perhaps it's best to start with our immigration program. Uh, we recognize that it's important to grow our population and to um, we have a mandate to grow it to 2 million by 2060, but also to grow it in a very targeted, thoughtful way. And so we have a campaign right now that is, is specifically targeting skilled trades workers and healthcare workers. And uh, that campaign is now in its second phase. It's been very, very successful. And I've referenced um, uh, to this committee in the past that we also have navigators in place so that when people uh, as a result of the campaign come forward and say we're interested in moving to Nova Scotia what kind of work is there is there for me with this particular trade we can attach them to navigators in communities throughout Nova Scotia to learn more about the the work opportunities that are there um, also part of that conversation is and where will I live and is, are there sports for my children and is there an opportunity for my partner and all of those conversations and so our navigators are working hard to um, uh, get community-based information back to people so that they can make a decision on whether or not they choose to come here. Uh, we have a, a our population growth strategy has several pillars. Immigration is one, in migration is another and then retention is a third retaining people who live here already. And so I'd like to speak about that for a minute. Um, so um, retain, we want to retain more of Nova Scotia's population and for people to see opportunity here and to see it here from a very young age. And um, so we're working closely with our partners, including the Nova Scotia Community College and others, to really get the message out that there is work in communities throughout Nova Scotia in the skilled trades. And so by having more people see skilled trades as an option, um, having more people decide that they want to stay here, they don't leave, need to leave to, to work in the skilled trades. And so our, our department's contribution to helping uh, resolve our housing challenges is to bring in the people with the skills to, needed to construct those houses and also to help people who are already here acquire the skills that they, that they are needed to contribute to growing the infrastructure that a growing population needs. Thank you very much. Uh, MLA Young. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll have my questions towards uh, NSCC. And uh, as a former NSCC faculty, I can think of some of the challenges having in rural Nova Scotia to generate some uh, interest in the trades. And uh, when you said that you were working with the LSI to boost immigration, to, um, to boost immigration here. Um, I'm wondering, is there any work around trying to attract, uh, you know, tradespeople into some of these rural areas that they can continue working in the trades and build, you know, get through the process? 
Uh, I was talking to a carpenter the other day, two and a half years to, to build a house. That's, that's the wait time in Shelburne, right? It's a long time. So my question would be, um, is there any updates that you may have on the international recruitment process or strategies? And that can go to NSCC or, or Deputy Zappalai. So, Mr. Bureau, you'd like to begin? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Young, for, for the question. One thing that I know that you would know is that in rural communities, a, a beacon of a new family coming to Canada is often an educational institution. They come to us often as an entire family uh, and they arrive at the front desk and see the institution as a place where they can find uh, a bit of a home and safety to prepare them for a, a life in, in um in Nova Scotia. As I travel around the province and meet with our campuses, I was in Shelburne on uh, last week, I saw very, very uh, on the ground examples of that campus being that, that beacon where people can come. So when we talk about welcoming and having um, skilled labor go to one of our rural communities, we have to think of it as a family uh, attraction, only an, individ an individual attraction. So when I speak to those campuses, my challenge to them is to create that warm, welcoming environment and a, and a soft landing for the entire family to come. In terms of our work, we work very closely with uh, Deputy Minister Zappale's office, as, as well as other organizations like EduNova, for example, where we create opportunities for people to come to Nova Scotia to study and then to stay after they're here. So connecting um, our students with the workforce as soon as possible creates that kind of stickiness that they can stay. The last thing I will say is that you're right. We are hearing these stories of carpenters who are taking two and a half years to, but we're also finding that our, that our rural small businesses are, are tremendously open to giving new Canadians opportunities. And what they need from us is a way to bridge that skill gap very quickly. So if someone needs help with English, someone needs help with a particular local skill set, we need to get that individual in and out quickly. And the last thing I'll say is one of the more popular ways of teaching and learning uh, is, a, is a work and learn model, where you come, you would work for a couple of days a week, and you'd learn for a couple of days a week. And that kind of cooperative effort is what it's going to take for us to crack this, this shortage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, MLA Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to ask uh, uh, Deputy Hackett if I could. Um, in your opening remarks, you talked about healthcare infrastructure. Obviously, uh, nothing more critical than that, I would say, on the infrastructure side. So, on the QE2 uh, redevelopment project, I'm going to ask a bit of a, a two parter here with the uh, Chair's indulgence. Um, first, is there an expectation within the department that skilled labor shortages will have an impact on that? particular project. And the second part, does the department have an up-to-date or latest estimate on cost and timeline for that project? Because uh, with all due, due respect to Mr. LeBlanc and others who've spoken about this, all we've heard on cost is that it will be more than the original estimate. And I think it would be good to know if that's a hundred million or a billion. So thank you. Deputy Minister Hackett. So the uh, so the I'll answer the first the second question first. So I don't have an update on cost um, at the at the moment. Uh, as you know, this project is still in procurement. We're still working with the uh, uh, with the vendor on this one, and uh, so our team is working on uh, cost and schedule. Uh, but they're working a, a very good rate uh, to get this thing landed. So uh, I, I don't have an update at this time. So I just let you know that. It, but it is. It is uh, going at a good pace, and, uh, and uh, we're very optimistic we have this thing landed soon. On the first question um, about the skills and labor, um, <clears throat> well, the hospitals are interesting. Um, they're big projects. Obviously, we have big projects in Cape Breton. Uh, we have a big NSC, uh, NSCC project going on in Cape Breton. Um, and the, uh, the skills for building these types of projects is a little unique sometimes. Uh, there are, you know, uh, 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 skilled labor in, you know, uh, Red Seal, electricians, plumbers, carpenters, which are all needed for all these projects. And sometimes in the, in the healthcare sector, there's specialized uh, people as well. So I would expect that, you know, the way that we've we've kind of pulled back uh, the, the HI project to to uh, um, kind of stagger that and other projects uh, that will help the the labor issue that we're in and I think that uh, we be able to stagger that and other projects that the uh, that their client and health wants to do that will take some pressure off off uh, the labor shortage we hope 
but however, I mean, obviously, uh, I mentioned NSC C in Cape Breton and, uh, um, and the Cape Breton um, Regional Project as well. Uh, we've worked from the beginning of those projects, and uh, Gerard Jessam and his team uh, have tried to stagger those so that we're not interfering with each project. So NSCC is continuing. I uh, did a tour there last week. It's coming along quite well. We've, we've moved into some of the work in, at Cape Breton, uh, which is kind of a little bit behind that project. You know, the, the foundations are in, the framework is up. Uh, we're a little bit behind on NSCC. So those we're hoping that the laborers at NSCC move over to the Cape Breton project. So that way we're trying to stagger those projects so that we don't interfere with the labor, the labor issues that we have. We would expect the same on the HI project. We know it's a big project. We know there'll be a lot of people on that site, uh, but we'll try to stagger our jobs around that so we don't take away the workforce from, from uh, other projects that would delay that project. So it's a process we're working on, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, MLA Sheehy Richard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to touch on that a little bit further, and in particular, um, what you're doing as a department to both attract and develop labors, the, the skilled labors that you need for these projects, um, competing with the, the labor that's going around all the time. So uh, it is a challenge, but I was just wondering what, what Department of Public Works was doing in particular to um, attract more uh, people to our, our workforce. Deputy Minister Hackett. Yeah, so the first part is um, our, our, two dep our two chief engineers, um, they work very closely with the industry. So with the road building industry and the uh, uh, Construction Association of Nova Scotia in kind of understanding what the needs are and what the shortages are out there um, and, uh, and trying to focus on uh, how to deliver the projects that we have to deliver. So if they see there's a shortage or there's going to be delays in certain projects, we try to look at what needs to go first. So if it's a, if it's a school that has to be built and done, another school may be delayed to get that school done first. Same thing with bridges. If we look at bridges, we say this is a bridge, this needs to be replaced, we'll do that one first, we'll stagger the next one out. So they're working with the industry to make sure that we can stagger the projects so that we can deliver the projects. Um, and we're working with them understanding what shortages they actually have. So. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and we're also working with our partners at Labour and Advanced Ed on their programs, trying to uh, figure out how, uh, what they're bringing in, what we need, and, and apprenticeship programs as well. Uh, so we're working very closely with them and, and uh, making sure that what we need, they understand what we need, and they can deliver on that uh, going forward. And I don't know, Ava, if you have any comment on that. Yeah. Deputy Minister Zappoli. I think, I think that's a great question to draw out how the departments work together. So in my opening remarks, I mentioned the, the uh, $1 million in funding to uh, support the Cape Breton infrastructure projects, and that goes to the earlier comment that um, some of the skilled workers needed to uh, build some of those um, uh, health care facilities uh, often require upgrading or new skills to do so. And so the $1 million was determined uh, to be the amount needed to help those workers upskill so that they are ready to, to work on those projects. And uh, uh, we, we worked with in coordination with TPW, but also with unions and employers in, Nova, in um, Cape Breton to understand what the skill sets would, needed would be. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Emily McDonald. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is to uh, Deputy Zaplak. Um So we've heard tons of news on immigrants coming here, but then having to go through regulatory processes to get them, you know, be able to work here. What has your department done to actually help minimize the regulatory burdens and increase um, worker movement, either moving to Nova Scotia from others or away? That's to who? Sorry. Deputy Minister Zeppelin. Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, so our, our immigration programs are economic immigration programs, so people come here with a job offer, and, um, and so uh, what we do is everything possible to help them get into that job opportunity and feel supported. Um, happily for Nova Scotia, they often come with partners and family and others who do need extra support and, and job opportunities. And then we also have people come through the regular federal immigration streams who, who come to Nova Scotia and look for work. So one of our programs I wanted to highlight, it's especially relevant to the topic today, and it's a program that ISANS delivers for us where skilled trades workers um, can register with ISANS and they work on a job site for three months. Uh, Nova Scotia pays the salary uh, and that gives the employer an opportunity to see in real time what their skills are and how their skills equate to the skills that a 
um, someone trained here in Nova Scotia would have. And so that program's been very successful, as you might appreciate, and it's a, one way to get um, uh, skilled workers into job sites faster and then hopefully connect to a permanent job after that. Thank you. Um, we'll go to MLA Ince. Thank you. Um, this uh, question will be for the apprenticeship agency. Um, if an individual who is working out west, um, who's looking to get their apprenticeship and they move home, how challenging is it for them to be able to get their additional skills or whatever they need as an apprentice? Mr. Soho. Thank you so much for that question. And the apprenticeship staff would certainly know the nuances to it. The beauty of, of, of trades is there's a lot of harmonization effort happening across the country to recognize trade as skills and experience that has been recognized in another jurisdiction to then when they come to Nova Scotia, be able to recognize that, that experience and that education as well. And if there are gaps, there are programs in place and the staff there work very closely with the individual to make sure that they can then meet the requirement that we would see in Nova Scotia. Thank you. Um, MLA Burrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the NSCC. Uh, as you know, uh, our party has long been associated with the, the, the call for uh, free tuition. Um, and uh, as with all such things, there are you know, arguments in favor, arguments against. But it seems to me that uh, in the context of the uh, the depth of the shortage of skilled trades professionals, uh, the the case for eliminating barriers, uh, uh, financial barriers, is stronger today than it, than it's ever been. Um, and from this point of view, I wonder: um, is 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 the college uh, looking at uh, reducing tuition or looking in a new way at uh, uh, financial barriers uh, in order to to expedite the, the the entry of people into the places where we need people the most? Mr. Bureau. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Bureau, for that question. Um, I, I'm going to just uh, think about the foundational pillar that NSCC was created upon back in 1996 when we became an independent board governed institution. And that goal was to democratize post secondary education. So, your question is spot on in terms of what we think about every day. How do we democratize? How do we remove barriers for people wishing to pursue a post secondary education? and get into a career. Um, the topic of free tuition is one that has been, as you said, talked about for a long time around the world with massive, massive studies being done. And it's shown that actually it's not the primary driver to increase access. Um, and if it's a financial burden, what we've done is we've, we've developed a very successful fundraising arm of the college and through bursaries and scholarships been able to reduce a lot of the barriers for our students. What we find to be more impactful is this notion of being truly an accessible college from the point of view of truly meeting learners where they are from learning a learning style point of view. So using something called universal design for learning, which is a very flexible way to allow people to meet their outcomes. One thing that we've also recognized is the importance of going to the learners and where they are. So setting up a learning centre on a First Nation community has been an incredible uh, boost in terms of increasing access. So to answer your question, I, I still am not sure if free, ac if free tuition is the primary driver, but we are committed to the multiplicity of, of uh, access orientated programs that will allow more and more people to come to the college. And we're seeing it. We're seeing more people with disabilities. We're seeing more people from First Nation communities. We're seeing more people um, from other communities who have traditionally faced those barriers. Thank you, Mr. Bureau. Um, MLA Hansen. Chair, uh, my question will be for Deputy Minister Zappale. You may be aware that there are international students studying to be doctors here in Nova Scotia but who can't complete their residencies here because they don't have permanent residency. My question is, is there any intent to change the requirements to make it easier for Canadian medical graduates with Canadian citizenship to do their medical residency in Nova Scotia? Deputy Minister Zappale. Well, thanks for the question. And, and yes, I've been following that uh, um, that that story. And, uh, and certainly... Um, 
our immigration and population growth branch is leaning in as hard as it can in partnership with Department of Health and Wellness, um, Seniors and Long-Term Care, Office for Health Care Professional Recruitment, Nova Scotia Health and others to uh, uh, recruit healthcare professionals to come here. Um, the marketing campaign that I referenced targeting skilled workers also actually the other the other branch of that recruits healthcare workers from rest of Canada. And so we are also um, uh, looking globally to bring in healthcare workers. So um, I've been watching with interest to, to um, anybody who comes forward and says, look, we found a barrier here. We'd like to know about it. What is the barrier, and uh, and is there is there something that can be done about that barrier? So we appreciate hearing hearing the the stories. Um, our focus is on making sure that healthcare workers who come here have a job opportunity, so they actually come here with job offers, and they and they uh, can get to work ASAP. And then for um, international students who are studying here, uh, we have a number of programs. One is um, a unique program, I think you might know about it, Study and Stay, um, that works uh, with students who indicate fairly early on in their studies that they'd like to stay in Nova Scotia. And we work with them to talk about the, the various pathways to staying here as a permanent resident and also helping them start with volunteer work, integrating into the community, eventually um, helping them connect with employers and then uh, hopefully to a job at, at the other end of that. So we have some programs that are, that are looking at how do we keep international students here in this province. Uh, MLA Hansen, I will allow for, um, yeah, for, for quick follow-ups as long as it's pertaining to your original question. So uh, MLA Hansen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what I'm hearing is that there there is an option. You guys are going to be working with these folks to be able to make sure that they can work, stay and work here and actually get their um, status, their um, uh, the residency and work through their, their medical field that we we desperately need more doctors in this province. So I'm just I, th I just want to make sure that that's what I'm hearing, that you are you will be working with those folks. Deputy Minister Zapley. Thanks. I, I can't comment on the individual circumstances of those the students that you're referencing. I think some of them have actually gone on and left Nova Scotia. But uh, one thing that we are doing is working with all international students to make sure that they understand what the pathways are to immigration and, and for those who want to stay. Uh, helping them understand those pathways, how to connect with community, how to connect with um, uh, work so that they can uh, as soon as they graduate, they can they can um, put down roots here and, and remain. That ideally, an international student who comes here to study is the ideal immigrant. Thank you very much, MLA Ritzy. Uh, this, this question is for uh, Deputy Minister Zappale. It's can you share any strategies the department has uh, in regards to encourage women and gender diverse uh, individuals into the trades? Deputy Minister Zappale. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the question, and certainly, um, actually, uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll say, Mr. Bureau, when we were touring the Nova Scotia Community College campus in Sydney, I was really pleased to see. Uh, I saw a woman painting, uh, a worker painting in, in the campus, and I saw some diverse workers on the campus, and I thought to myself, uh, it's good to see our policies in action here. So I referenced earlier that we do have a, a program that does require, um, in Cape Breton specifically for the infrastructure projects, that 25% of the those hired will be apprentices, and of those, 10% will be uh, equity-deserving um, uh, apprentices. So uh, we do we do work with employers and the NSCC and and with um, unions to have to put some some benchmarks around that. But we also have some wonderful programs that have shown great success um, in terms of supporting people uh, who wish to to um, forge a career in the trades. And so I, uh, one of my colleagues here referenced the pathways to shipbuilding um, projects. I think that best showcases the success that we can have when we have small cohorts of, of individuals um, working towards a trade, in this case it was welding, and uh, with wraparound supports and, and feelings, a sense of community um, amongst themselves. So uh, we've had, I can't, how many cohorts do, does anyone remember? It's probably at least five or six, Jill? Uh, 
Okay, so oh, I think no, no, I no it's, it's I think <laughs> maybe what I'll do, uh, Deputy Zappa, is I'll, I'll allow you to finish the question, and then if someone would like to respond to it, uh, I know Mr. Bureau, you wanted to, and then uh, anyone after that, but we'll just kind of keep it fairly structured if we could. My my apologies, <laughs> Deputy um, Zappa. So, so we do have we we have some very successful pilots that do more to encourage uh, women and and equity deserving groups to um, consider the skilled trades. We also work with communities, so Mi'kmaq and Indigenous communities and African Nova Scotian communities to uh, find out what kinds of opportunities. Um, uh, are available in the trades uh, with those communities and helping uh, students um, seek the skills and the training that they need near their community so that they can stay and contribute to work there closer to home. So I'll, I'll leave you. it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bureau, you'd like to comment as well? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will ask with your permission uh, for my colleague. Um, just two points. I will ask my colleague to speak on a program called Women Unlimited, which is a very successful program, and also about a program that we refer to as 202020, uh, a program that uh, my colleague is very familiar with, with the Irving Shipbuilding. I will say that we are also working very closely with the industry. Um, we need to ensure that the industry partners that we work with create a safe environment for our female apprentices and workers to go into non-traditional occupations. And I saw that firsthand as I toured the facility last week and speaking with some of the female apprentices on site who did speak very highly of the mentorship and the coaching that they're receiving from older, more experienced male tradespeople. So I think that's beginning to shift, but I think collectively we need to create those safe spaces in industry for our female apprentices. Ms. Provo. Thank you so much. Um, so I will respond to, to Don's prompt, the Women Unlimited program. Many folks here are probably quite familiar with that program. It's been running for, I believe, maybe close to 20 years as a partner with NSCC. I see smiles. It's quite a wonderful program. It officially transitioned to Nova Scotia Community College as one of our programs about two years ago. Mm -hmm. I was significantly involved in that program, so it does run um, through the college, bringing cohorts of 15 to 20 women at several locations throughout Nova Scotia. They they do about 14 weeks of preparation, they experience different trades, and then of course we hope they move into trades and technology programming across the province. And the um, woman who is the program director of that initiative is also an African Nova Scotian woman who cares deeply about also bringing diversity, racial diversity and other forms of diversity. So we're getting women into the trades and we're getting women from diverse backgrounds into the trades. So really proud that we are now delivering officially the Women Unlimited program. Um, in terms of the Irving Center of Excellence Shipbuilding Programming, um, there have been two cohorts of all women groups that have gone through um, Pathways to Shipbuilding initiatives. Um, we're now running our second Mi'kmaq or Indigenous um, cohort of learners through those initiatives, and the 2020 for 2020 um, group is our African Nova Scotian cohort. Um, they were going through the program of welding. And um, I will just speak very briefly to it. It is such a source of pride, and I give full credit to community for that initiative. But we had 20 African Nova Scotian students start that program. 20 African Nova Scotian students complete that program. That is a 100% retention rate. Um, 13 of those students with honors. Um, that is throughout a pandemic. And so quite an exceptional experience. And I said full credit to students, of course, we were involved, but just an incredible group. So the success of bringing cohorts of learners from specific communities, be they gender or be they racialized communities, is something we take great pride in. In many cases, the last thing I will say on those initiatives is that they're also, they're usually separate initiatives from our core funding. So to a question that was asked some time ago, those particular initiatives also generally do not have tuition um, that are charged for students in those particular programs as well, so the tuition is covered. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Soho, you'd like to comment as well? Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I may add, because uh, uh, Mr. Bureau uh, in indicated industry, and industry has done a lot of work in this space in partnership with the college around a program called Shift Change uh, with YWCA as well. So that's been a program that uh, educates male supervisors on how to create more welcoming workplaces on job sites. And that's been hu hugely successful in the construction industry. Also, I'd like to share with the committee that um, there's an organization called Build Together, which is a construction-focused organization that takes a look at how to provide supports for women who are entering into the construction trades, as well as the Office to Advanced Women Apprentices, uh, which is a federally funded program that in partners with unions and contractors to help provide supports again for those uh, uh, women pursuing opportunities in apprenticeship. Thank you. Thank you very much all for your answers. 
Um, MLA Young. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just in case that uh, there's a bunch of high school people on the fence right now, thinking, what trade should I get into or maybe career change? Um, I'm just curious, is, um, is there, are there any trades that are more in demand than others right now? And um, is there any work that's being done to popularize, popularize some of the skilled training and that would be to apprenticeship? Mr. Sohol. Thank you so much for that question and I could spend all day on this one. Um, <laughs> There, you have just you know, five minutes. <laughs> most. Five minutes. I, pre I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, depending on what what time of year we're in, and depending on what stages of projects, we'll really identify what occupations are in the immediate demand. We encourage youth to find something they're passionate about and to pursue that. And there's a number of avenues to do that through apprenticeship, through training, what have you. Uh, a way to learn of what's available, though, um, I'm proud to say the Construction Sector Council, we have a facility called the Trades Exhibition Hall that we've brought in through thousands of youth to introduce them to uh, 14 different interactive booths around the different occupations in the construction industry. We have a mobile tra uh, training center called the Mobile Construction Experience that goes to junior highs around the province, and it opens up on the sides, and youth can try out different occupations to learn what they like and what they don't like, because both are, both are valuable. And we're also working with the Department of Education right now in getting building kits to the classroom so they can actually put their hands on real construction materials to say, yes, I like this, or no, I don't like this. And again, both are good results from that. Um, and so we're seeing, we're seeing youth uh, really ask some really um, intentional questions of opportunity. And what we share with our youth when we see them every second day in the facility, um, there's opportunities for you with where you find interest. And that could be in the trades, that could be in the management space. Um, and then we're happy to help direct you to our, our appropriate partners then to pursue that apprenticeship training if that's, if that's the direction they, they care to pursue or towards employment in some cases as a direct entry. That was a very good answer. Sorry, I limited you to your time. Um, but I'm sure that there will be uh, opportunities for members if they uh, would like to uh, offer more to make contact with any of our witnesses after to get more information. Um, we'll go to MLA Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to comment quickly on something that uh, MLA Hansen said earlier, stole my thunder, but it was a very good point um, from the, uh, the CMHC rental report the other day. Uh, I thought it was really interesting that the number of um, people leaving Nova Scotia increased 33% year over year. Uh, I hope that's not the beginning of a trend, but it is something I think collectively I think we need to keep our eyes on as a, I think, uh, Reasons unclear, but I think it's reasonable to assume this could be related to not finding a place to live that's affordable, perhaps not having access to health care, labor shortages, whatever the case might be. I think all of those things are interconnected. So um, as some have said, you know, it's a, it's a good problem to have, to have people moving to the province after decades of the alternative. But um, we don't want to tip too far in the other direction where people say, I got to go somewhere where I can afford to live. So just wanted to editorialize perhaps uh, on that first. And then I wanted to ask, um, Mr. Bureau, you, you mentioned in your opening comments uh, perhaps a bit of a misalignment maybe at the college between, in some cases, industry demand and student interest. You had some programs that are very high in demand from industry but low uptake and vice versa, which obviously is not you know, the most efficient um, way to, to, to have things go. So I'm wondering how do you address that issue? How do you balance things out so that the graduates that you're producing match up well, as well as they possibly can, with demand in industry at the time. Thank you. Mr. Bureau. I know we say this every time, but that's a great question. Like that is just, I've been involved with post-secondary education for over 25 years, and there's an art and a science to predicting supply and demand in our world. And when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, one of the best sayings I ever heard was, was the future arrived 10 years early. And what I, what I say, what I mean by that is the planning horizons for predictability for labor and education matches. At one time you could predict out five years and it became three years and it became 18 months. Now their horizons are six and eight months out in terms of how, th how things are changing. <clears throat> so in our world, not only do you want to provide an individual, a graduate if you will, with the skills that are needed today, you need to prepare them to be able to be lifelong learners for the skills of tomorrow and beyond. So it's a duality of what's the hard skill that's required to be the best welder, the best plumber you can possibly be, but also to, desire, to, to, to develop this desire for continuous intake of new and updated uh, approaches to your, to your work. 
<clears throat> that being said, we work daily with industry through our our advisory committees to make sure that we are providing the skills that are required on those job sites. And because of the very nature of the college, we have a fluidity, we have a flexibility or a responsiveness that's quite quick and responsive. And we try to encourage that as much as possible. It even boils down to our infrastructure. There was a time when you'd build a lab or a shop that was a dedicated shop for welding for the next 25 years. That piece of infrastructure, that, that 800 square feet may be a plumbing lab this year and a welding lab next year. And you need that flexibility to, to, to turn on a dime. The last thing I will say is that, as my colleagues have said, there has been a, a change of narrative required. You know, 25 years ago, we all collectively made decisions that perhaps has resulted in a lost generation of, of people looking for the trade sector as a, as a viable career. And we're having to re-educate our youth that this is a, a place where you can have a proud, productive, impactful career. And once they get their heads wrapped around that, the last thing I'll say, which is true, is being an auto mechanic is not your father's auto mechanic type of work. It's an auto technician. And I toured one of our mechanic shops last week, and there was more IT in that la shop than there were wrenches. So we need to say to a young person, you can take your gaming skills and apply those to a very lucrative career in electronic vehicles and have a very, very different um, career going forward. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's still time. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, we'll move to MLA Sheehy Richard and then MLA McDonald and then MLA Burl. So MLA Sheehy Richard. Well, if we're applying our gaming skills to the mechanical industry, then we are not going to have any shortage of labor coming up. The pipes, I can rest assured. Everybody kind of chuckled at that one. Um, I just want to go back to uh, Deputy Minister Hackett when you talked about um, that you have to make decisions on which infrastructure projects that you are that are a priority. Can you go into a little bit more detail what the decision making process uh, behind these infrastructures? Like, how do you get these, like, how do you make those decisions on um, which projects are the priority? Deputy Minister Hackett. Yeah, so um, in the department, uh, thank you, Chair. In the, um, in the department, we work with our client departments, um, internally transportation's in our department, uh, but our client departments, education, health, um, justice. Um, and so we work with them on their capital pro programs. Um, so for education, uh, they're currently working on their current five-year capital plan. Um, they'll make a priority of which uh, schools they would like to see replaced or which schools should be new. Um, and we look at that and say that, you know, which ones are uh, in need today and, and which one we'll put on that list because they, either by population or because it's an old infrastructure. Uh, so we, we work with our client departments to justify which ones should go uh, ahead of the other ones, and like I said, it's based on pop population growth. Same with health, whether they're clinical needs across the province, uh, whether it be South Shore and uh, uh, Pugwash we're working on, Cape Breton, uh, the HI project, we work with them to say which ones do they need first to um, to address their clients' needs, which is, their, which is the patients. In transportation, uh, it would be the same thing. Uh, we put out our, our five-year plan. It just came out back in uh, 1st of January. Um, and on that, when they put the projects out, particularly on the bridge side, uh, they'll put them out in, in the uh, the need they have to go in on, on which ones are needed first uh, to replace first because of the safety part of it. So there's a whole process internally uh, with our staff, internally with, with transportation, working with our districts and working with our district staff on the highway side, on the building side. Um, they work with the client department departments and our engineers and architects work with them uh, to ensure they, they deliver the, the first ones in need first. That's, uh, that is basically the process and it, and it works quite well. Um, most of the time uh, we're not in a, in a situation where we're in right now. We can deliver pretty quickly and get things out the door and get most of our projects done but we do have to stagger a little bit I think right now because of the client that we're in, uh, climate that we're in. Um, but in normal times that so we've gone through for a lot of years on our capital program that has usually stayed quite you know, just a, a bit of progression over the years. Uh, we've been able to deliver everything pretty much as we put them out. Right now, it's we have a larger, much larger capital program than we've ever had, and so we're trying to put those things out to make sure we can deliver them on time and on budget. But uh, you know, making sure that we can get them done as well. Emily, she shared for a follow-up. 
I just have a little bit more follow up on the public works side of those infrastructure projects. So in rural Nova Scotia, the roads are, you know, there, there's a lot of catching up to do, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, you have bridges that are that are seeming to take a lot longer that then impacts um, what construction can be done. So is that uh, is that something that some of that new capital plan project uh, increase that will look at trying to address them um, simultaneously so infrastructure and buildings are being done, but also um, how do we fast track catching up on the infrastructure and the roads as well? Deputy Minister Hackett. Yes, yeah, so the so, uh, thank you, Chair. So the um, uh, the province did give us some uh, additional funding for bridges in the in the last budget, um, which doubled our bridge replacement program. So that's very been very helpful. And then obviously uh, we've been uh, we've got more money for our, uh, rural improvement money as well on RIM, which has been helpful for the paving part of it. One of the one of the issues I think that. Um, you know, in, in this climate that we're in, that we haven't really seen before, which is kind of relating to the bridge uh, program. Um, so we only have so many bridge contractors. And for a lot of years, they were looking at replacement costs of, uh, we were putting between 30 and $40 million into replaced bridges. We amped that up to probably between 60 and 70 million now, double it. So we put more pressure on the industry to basically get to that level, uh, which they will get to. They need to bring in people and materials and so on. And so you bring it up to a new level of capital and, they, and the industry brings in the people that they need. So we're a little tricky right now because we're talking labor shortage, but we're getting there. And I think that's one of the issues that we currently have in the entire capital world, whether it's uh, building infrastructure, highway infrastructure, is that we're in a different climate that's not as predictable as it used to be. So the industry can't ramp up as they did. They know this is coming, they know this is happening, and things where we are now with materials, labor, um, in inflation, it's all kind of going a bit like this. So once that kind of levels off, which is starting to, um, all the, uh, the good money that we've got will be able to be um, put towards the bridges, the, 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 the contractors will come in, they'll be able to get them done on time, um, get them on budget. Right now we've put those out, but once again, we've had to stagger a lot of those projects because of the shortages and the costs that they're coming in at. That will level off in time and the contractors will pick that up and we'll be able to deliver uh, more with the, with the funding that we have. But right now, because of the uncertainty and everything, uh, you know, contractors are, are sort of uh, looking at all this as, as risk, but but we're managing that as well. Thank you very much, uh, Emily McDonald. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and this will be for NSCC as a, I graduated in 1990, so at IW Akerty, so 33 years ago I decided I liked IT. Um, so, but as now it's. Adults are changing how they want to learn. So what actual, how are you expanding different training and continual learning opportunities for adults that are coming to NSCC for like career path changes? Mr. Bureau. Uh, thank you, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Chair. If I may, I'll say a few comments and then ask my colleague to comment on how we're changing the way of delivery at the college. Um, but to your point, what we're finding is that the average age of a student at NSCC is about 26 or 28 years old. And what that means is that our learners are coming to class with a, um, a life that has many dimensions to it. Aging parents, children, careers, and that requires us to offer a much more flexible learning environment that meets them where they are. And I'll ask my colleague, Vice President Provo, to comment on some of the particulars that she's working on with her team to meet that changing style of learning. And Ms. Provo. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, President Bureau. Um, absolutely, and there has been um, significant learning throughout the pandemic as well. You saw, I have these um, charts I've delivered at previous presentations where you see the delivery of our programming, especially you know, as applied college being pretty much fully online pre-pandemic and of course we had this shift in about 2020 because everything was locked down so you're moving to online and so we're still kind of digesting I would say at NSCC and as a post-secondary sector about what are the learnings from that because of course we are going to go back to a lot of in-person learning which we have 
but we're also not going back to this pre-pandemic reality of not having that flexibility because a lot of students did enjoy that flexibility. So now you're seeing about a third of our programming actually having what we would call blended offerings. So they do a significant amount of the learning in person, but there's also some learning that they can do um, online and really enhancing that flexibility. And so we're seeing that those learnings really shift into our official program delivery what is coming in the future you know there's lots of conversation about just continuing to explore that flexibility so there are models out there that we are looking at where students literally can choose if they want to be learning in the classroom environment if they want to be learning online that of course comes with careful considerations to make sure our faculty are well prepared to deliver excellent um, excellent programming in those um, in those um, in those environments as well we are always thinking about the future needs of our learners looking and analyzing our survey data seeing what they're telling us and trying to respond accordingly to ensure that we have the delivery they 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 require one mr bureau <laughs> just very quickly we're also working very closely with other post-secondary institutions so you are able to ladder your learning or be recognized for your learning so you can actually bundle your learning experience at the college and at say Santa of x university and put that together for an educational experience that will help you even more with your career going forward. Thank you. Uh, Emily Burrell. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Minister Zappoli, I, I, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the importance of the, the quality of the work experience of immigrants. Uh, uh, because, you know, in, particularly in, at this moment, we not only need people to come, we, we, need, we need them to, to need to choose Nova Scotia. So that uh, that, that initial work experience and the, the quality of that is, is awfully important from the point of view of retention. And, and in, in our offices, um, uh, we do hear some about, uh, with the Provincial Nominee Program, uh, that uh, uh, because, I, I think it's because, people's position uh, is their employment is tied in with their, with their status is tied to their employment. Uh, so the really the employees are in quite a vulnerable situation and it's a, it's a kind of situation uh, that is um, uh, I think prone uh, to uh, in, inadequate consideration of employee circumstances and we hear complaints of, of uh, abusive really uh, work situations. I wonder if this um, if this is anything that's ever uh, uh, within the view of the department on your radar, and if are, is there thinking about uh, Im improving uh, what, what might done might, might done to might be done to improve the work situations of uh, uh, people, particularly in the PMP? Deputy Minister Zappoli. Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Burrell. Um, you're spot on when you say that that first work experience is really really important. Um, we often um, um, talk about uh, not so much recruitment, but retention. If people are choosing to come here, and there are, there's no shortage of people who want to immigrate to Canada and to Nova Scotia, but if they're choosing to come here, then it's our responsibility to welcome them well. I believe a committee member once said, from this group said, settle them well, and that really resonated um, with me. So, so what does that look like? Um, through our immigration program, uh, you re referenced PNP, but I'll mention the AIP, the Atlantic Immigration Program, that re went from being a five-year pilot. Now it's a permanent program. When it became a permanent program, we built a couple things into that program. So it's the responsibility of employers now to take a, a cultural competency program. It's offered through ISANS. All employers have to take it in order to be designated. I, and you have to be designated to participate in the Atlantic Immigration Program. So Nova Scotia employers take that program. What we're finding from uh, people who take the program is that they're asking for it to be offered as well to all of their staff. So employers are saying this is a worthwhile program, it's useful, and we want to change the culture of our workplace, and so we want to make it more widely available. So ISANS is reporting great uptake with the program. The other part of the Atlantic Immigration Program uh, is that employers are required to come up with a settlement plan for the for their immigrant employees. So how do they settle well in their community? So they're working with local settlement providers to work out a settlement plan. So if they're offering someone a job and that person is coming from another country to Nova Scotia to take that job, how are they going to be settled well in their community? And so that plan has to also be in place. So those are, those are examples of steps that we're taking to make sure that 
people are settled well. I will say that we also have a network of community partners. Um, we work with economic development, for example, in the RENs, but we also have our own uh, navigators, as I mentioned, and we work with chambers and, and uh, uh, settlement providers throughout Nova Scotia to um, ensure that people are settling well. And that means welcoming communities as well as welcoming workplaces. Thank you very much. Uh, MLA Ince. Thank you. Um, my question is open to anyone. Um, I've heard a lot of conversation around attracting youth, getting youth involved, trying to get them interested in the trades. Has any of you had conversations with Department of Education and talking about trades at that lower level like in the schools? We have one school that has the ability to give some trade, and it's not being utilized enough. So I'm just wondering if, if there are conversations at that lower level to try to grab those youth at that younger age. Okay, so I think what we'll do, um, in the interest of time, I, I'd, I'm sure I don't want to mute any of your voices, but I think we'll maybe just limit this response to three at the most, if there is that many that would like to respond, so we can carry on with our conversations. Uh, so I, I did see Mr. Soholt's hand, so we'll, Mr. Soholt. Thank, thank you for that question. Um, the Department of Education has engaged a variety of different sectors in different ways to get some, some activities at the, at the grade level of six and seven. Uh, so there's some intentional effort, even to the point of building it into curriculum where industry activities and industry experience is built into curriculum. And we're seeing that happen with some of the things in the construction sector. Similarly, the apprenticeship agency has youth, uh, youth um, I'm trying to remember the exact title that they, that they, they have, uh, youth expertise, where they will go to classrooms as well and talk about the opportunities for apprenticeship across all of the sectors. Um, so a lot of that is being built into the early education process. And Ms. Provo, you'd like to comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will add, um, for us as well, a lot of quite intentional recruitment happens in our public school system, and people going out into schools and encouraging folks to try our trades programming and other initiatives, so that is certainly quite intentional from our recruitment team. Um, but I would also add that we are um, in early conversations and continue to be eager to have conversations about what it would look like to have more dual crediting opportunities within our high school system, specifically in the trades, so students can actually gain some credits Why they are still in the post-secondary sector. And then when they come here, they're on a bit of an accelerated path. So that is, of course, a, a collaboration across some of the partners um, here today, um, but really keen and excited about what opportunities may come to, to give that opportunity to actually start um, while you're still in the public school system. So that is a pathway we're very eager to explore as well. Thank you. And Deputy Minister Zappalay. Thanks for the question. So I have, I have to admit, when I first came to this position, I, I really had to double check a number. And that number was that 0.3% of high school students go on to a skilled trade. And I, I, I thought a one was missing, so, right? So why is that? Why do we have 40% going on to university, approximately 40% to NSCC, and 0.3% thinking of skilled trades? So, um, so we do have to speak with young people sooner, and we also, also have to speak to family and friends and change the culture. I think uh, Mr. Bureau talked about professionalizing trades. Um, a, a career in the trades is a very, very good career, and parents need to understand that, and that um, uh, students can be can have a, a very fulfilling, lifelong career in their community, in in the skilled trades. And so, um, with it, uh, you asked about partnering with ECD. We, so we do um, school outreach. Uh, we're trying to get into the classrooms at a younger age to um, just start to plant that seed um, that skilled trades are an option for students to think about. Um, I also, uh, we have, we work in partnership with the Construction Association, NSCC, and many others. I love the trades trailer. 
when I was a little kid, I used to wait for the bookmobile to roll into, into Barrington, <laughs> right? And so it, the trades trailer, uh, there's some kids probably waiting for the trades trailer to roll into their community and, and show them what it looks like. We went to the trades hall. It's amazing. If you haven't been, uh, it really gives you a sense as to what the trades are that are available. So I know that um, exposing young kids to the trades hall uh, it would be a dream come true for a lot of a lot of students, but it's really changing the culture and making sure that um, those who influence children's decisions, teachers and parents, appreciate that trades are a wonderful career option for for many students. Um, so we're looking at the capacity that we have, both at the community college and, and in some, some of the high schools, um, and see how we can use that capacity during downtimes to offer things like summer camps and other things to really engage, engage young people in trades-related activity and help them not only make the decision to go into the trades, but to make sure it's the right decision from that for them so that they stay in the trades. Thank you all very much for those comments. Uh, MLA Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members of the committee will know that a living wage is calculated based on actual expenses to show exactly how much a household would have to earn to cover all basic necessities and allow families to enjoy a decent quality of life. It is significantly higher than the province's minimum wage. For example, Cape Breton's $20, Annapolis $20.40, Southern $20.55, and Northern, I think you guys get the point, $20.40. Experiences in Alberta, Ontario, and across the U.S. show that big increases in the minimum wage don't create inflation or job loss, yet the Premier has not agreed to accelerate the path to $15 minimum wage recommended by the Minimum Wage Review Committee almost a month ago. So my question would be for the Nova Scotia Construction Council, Mr. Sohol. Um, can you explain how wages for skilled labor in Nova Scotia factor into the competition that we find ourselves in with other provinces around attracting and retaining workers? Mr. Sohol. Thank you for that question. Um, wages is, is, is certainly a big topic. Um, in, I can only speak for ICI construction, so industrial commercial institutional is the sector that I work in, everything bigger than a house and not a road um, is the easy definition. Uh, in our sector, we have uh, very competitive wages that do um, usually meet or exceed the living wage. Um, when we look at other jurisdictions, though, some of the things that we, we, we struggle with is hourly weight, w rates for projects in Northern Alberta or Northern Ontario could be significantly higher than that. There may be travel allowances that are built into that. There may be housing or um, accommodation allowances um, that are built into that. And those are those are some, some of the things that we struggle with as a province because we don't have that same industrial competition for work. And the way we our industry is kind of structured is we have sort of commercial institutional work, which would be the hospitals and the, and the um, schools and what have you, and then we have industrial. And on the horizon with some of the industrial projects that are being proposed, I think those will be amazing major attraction um, based on a wage rate and based on sustainable employment for our province. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing Nova Scotia kind of evolve in a lot of new ways. Um, but but to, your, to your point, wages is, is something that we have to be mindful of at any given point uh, to be competitive not only within the province, among sectors, but with other, other jurisdictions in Canada. Thank you very much. MLA Young. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just I got to make a comment. When you mentioned the 0.3% that were going into the trades and the 40% going into the university system, I know they piloted out west, uh, major in a science, minor in plumbing, right? I mean, we have the network here thinking outside the box. Um, one other comment I just wanted to make would be around pre-apprenticeship. If you had pre-apprenticeship graduates, could have a transition into a full apprenticeship registry, right? Because a direct entry, you could sign off with no, essentially no time. I think that would alleviate so much as well. But my question is, <laughs> um, to the apprenticeship, are there any plans during this modernization of apprenticeship? Um, I guess, what are the plans? Is there anything around bridging to other trades? Is there anything around micro-credentialing that we heard before? Maybe you could expand on that. Mr. Soho. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the question and, and I'll also, also invite uh, some of my colleagues to speak on this as well. In apprenticeship, there's multiple pathways to apprenticeship. So I, I do want to share with the committee, we have pre-apprenticeship pre uh, pathway, we have a direct entry pathway when an individual can meet with an employer tomorrow and, and register as an apprentice. And as long as they have a certified journey person to lear learn, be learn beside, they can go through that process as well. Um, the agency is heavily involved with other staff through labor skills and immigration around micro-credentialing and with partners at the NSCC and other other um, training providers to look at how micro-credentialing does fit into our education space. 
Um, but there are multiple pathways, and that individual uh, really has the ability to say, do I want to go to a community college route to pursue my training, to learn what it is before I get into employment? They can go to an employer directly. Uh, there's a number of bridging programs that go through industry as well, where maybe they connect with an industry organization, association council, the union, what have you, and there could be training opportunities that, that way as well. Um, and so what our message to youth is, and what our message is to future apprentices, is find the path that works best for you. Um, and, and first find that career that's best for you, but then find that pathway. And then we have staff at the apprenticeship agency to help you navigate that process. Thank you. MLA Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask um, uh, <clears throat> Deputy Hackett quickly about school construction as well. So uh, in the latest uh, capital plan here, I believe there's uh, yeah 13 schools designated for construction. I have a new school uh, in, in my riding that's opening in September, which is fantastic, obviously, but that school was delayed for a year uh, opening. Um, my understanding was due to material and labor shortages, not, not surprisingly. So I'm just wondering if that experience uh, is repeating itself across the province on the school side. Are you seeing delays um, in, in school construction as a result of whether it's labor or material shortages? Thank you. Deputy Minister Hackett. So I'm going to answer that, and I'm wondering if um, Gerard Jessen, the chief engineer and uh, executive engineer, could step up and just maybe some more detail on it. Um, so we are, I think, uh, for the most part, on track with our school construction as we go through it. One thing we are seeing is the uh, is the cost. So you know, our estimated costs of, of uh, when we put them together, uh, when the when the tenders come in, they're usually quite a bit more than what we're expecting. And a lot of that has to do with the materials and the labor shortages. I think specifically, uh, you know, uh, the, your, the school in Bedford uh, had some delays. Uh, Gerard could speak a bit about that. But certainly um, not just in the school world, uh, but in the other uh, infrastructure, the, the rural costs are, co are, are, are being more inflated sometimes than the city cost because of the, of the labor shortages in those areas. So what ends up hap happening is, you know, you get a you get a school in I'll say uh, Cumberland County or maybe in the Valley. You don't have the labor there, so labor has to come in. You got to pay for uh, food, accommodations uh, for those uh, those contractors, and they come back out. So we see that happening more, um, and it's not just in schools. It's in road work. It's in in uh, hospitals and other things as well. So that's something that I I think that uh, we have to kind of be mindful of when we do our estimates and and when we do these projects because. Every project uh, we put down is, a, is an urgency to, to build, so we have to build them. We just have to be mindful of the costs and, and the, and the um, uh, you know, sort of the obstacles we're up against. But I'll just ask Gerard to sit up if that's okay. Yep. Uh, we'll ask Mr. Jessamine to please come forward. Mr. Jessam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the question, Mr. Clark. Um, yeah, no, there, there is challenges, right? But, uh, you know, in the industry today with labor shortages, uh, supply chain, uh, inflation for sure, right? Uh, but we're managing those risks, I guess. Uh, you know, with the school you mentioned, we're, uh, we're, I think the opportunities that have opened up is more collaboration with industry across the board, right? So that particular uh, school is a collaborative uh, design build project, we call it. So we're working very closely with the contractor throughout the design process, throughout the construction process to overcome those challenges. And I think that's the way forward, I think, to, to help manage some of those risks that we're experiencing. But uh, yeah, there has been delays. COVID has, uh, has, uh, has brought a lot of challenges to us, but I think we're finding innovative solutions to overcome those challenges. Thank you very much. And welcome to the big table. <laughs> uh, we'll pass it over to MLA McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I ask a question, um, I did want to comment to the NSCC that uh, my two years, it was 50%, made it to second year, and they didn't finish to the point that you got 20 out of 20 your staff are doing a great job because I've never heard of everybody coming in finishing. So that's great on yours. Although my question is actually going to go to Mr. Schofield. Um, what are the biggest barriers and the biggest um, opportunities facing adult populations that are wanting to go into retraining opportunities? Mr. Sohol. Thank you for that question. The biggest barriers and, and biggest opportunities. Um, Sometimes one of the biggest barriers that we see with individuals looking to apprenticeship or looking to the construction industry is just awareness of what the opportunities might be. 
uh, understanding what occupations exist, where the demand might be, uh, and the supports that are in place through the province, through LSI, and through other agents, uh, through other departments to help ad advance that person's um, a career. The opportunities, well, that's going to be my closing piece. Uh, there's opportunities abound right now for anybody who's looking at apprenticeship, anybody who's looking at any of our apprenticeable sectors, because we have four sectors under apprenticeship. Uh, it's it's the opportunities in front of us with population growth, with generational investment, with access to training unlike ever before, um, with with just uh, in a nuance around procurement, being able to to require apprentices be on these projects. These are all opportunities that I think we don't take enough time celebrating that we're doing really, really well in this province. And I'm happy to share with this committee, when I go across the country, my <clears throat> colleagues across the country say, what is Nova Scotia doing so differently that the rest of us can't figure out? And it's having conversations like this. It's, it's looking at innovative ways of engaging people in career opportunities, providing supports, bringing training to them in the community in some respects. Uh, it's, it's looking at how do I transition from one sector to another. And, and truth be told, um, you know, COVID did introduce a lot of nuances that we weren't anticipating. And, and as a construction industry, we grew during COVID mm -hmm. because we were still active, we were deemed essential. And, and those who weren't able to find employment in their sector looked at construction as an opportunity as well. And so what we need to do is, is really be, be open and, and share those opportunities, share the prospects, share the realities of working in our sectors and strengthen our apprenticeship process so that we do have certified trades professionals coming out after their, after their training. Thank you, Mr. Saul. Yeah. MLA Sheehy Richard. I just wanted to talk a little bit. The, the health care project uh, was asked early on, but I, have, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on, in particular, on the December 15th announcement, uh, the more, faster, the Action for Health build and a comprehensive plan for improving health care services for Nova Scotians. Can you elaborate on why, it, why this new plan is a more comprehensive plan? And, and I guess also, like, how that new plan is going to impact the amount of labor needed to deliver the several, several major projects at once. Deputy Minister Hackett. So I can only speak to the infrastructure portion of that. I, I, I can't get too much into the client part, of which would be the clinical part. Um, on that particular project, uh, the, from my understanding, is that uh, on the HI particularly, is that the, um, the services are, will be the same. It will just be uh, built at certain stages, um, and it'll, be, you know, it'll come along as those, those parts come on. And then there'll be other components to it as well, um, which uh, I think there's an addition to uh, Dartmouth General and Cobbequid. Um, so the, the, I guess as, as far as uh, the importance on the labor part of the skills part is that you know, no, no different than we were talking about Cape Breton earlier. Um, you can get uh, a good part of, a, of the hospital at the HI site done. Uh, you can get people into beds there quicker. Um, and then you can move to another site, taking that, uh, you know, that those, as those labor sort of staggered as foundation folk or fr fr frame workers or form workers, they go to the next site, then the next site, and then they come back. And so when you're, if you've got, if you're flush with labor, uh, maybe you don't have to do quite that. But if you're not, this is one strategy in order to get uh, those projects done and, and get them done on time and get them done done well. And then you come back and continue to do more. So that's uh, that is sort of the the mindset behind uh, on, on this delivery. Thank you, Emily Burrell. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to think uh, to be hacking about a uh, little bit more about the the. Uh, the hospital redevelopment. Um, you know, this business of a, a shortage of uh, skills trades professionals in hospital construction, this is not a Nova Scotia problem, right? It's a, it's a big time in the hospital redevelopment world a, across the country. And, uh, and, and we, you, we, we do hear, I'm sure you would hear a lot more than I would, but, but I hear a little about how uh, uh, in other parts of the country, um, uh, innovative things are being developed in order to to draw and attract people to uh, certain projects. I think of that project in Terrace, BC, where they've reorganized all the uh, schedule in order to make it attractive for people to come in. So you've spoken about staggering as a way of uh, uh, addressing the situation in Nova Scotia, but are there um, are there other things uh, that we are doing or or could be doing uh, at a time when uh, demand for uh, hospital construction work is so intense across the country that to uh, to uh, make 
to make our projects more attractive to the, those particular uh, skill sets that we need. Deputy Minister Hackett. So earlier, um, uh, Chief Engineer uh, Jessa mentioned about collaboration. So there is a, a lot of collaboration going on with the industry on um, school construction and specific health construction um, with the uh, uh, with the contractors and the designers and the estimators. Uh, you know about how we can deliver these projects so that um, you know we're a little unique in, in, in the process that we do in them. Um, and so we are looking at innovative ways of trying to make those kind of work. Uh, we've done a P3 project right now in Bears Lake. We're doing uh, uh, construction management projects in Cape Breton. Um, and they're about bringing in trades at certain sectors and, and staggering those projects as well. The one thing that, and I mentioned earlier, that it's unique is that the province, uh, not just, you know, the private sector, um, and you talked about housing, you talked about um, all those things, we are we are in a whole different world in, in the sense of our capital construction. Our capital projects are, uh, our, our capital program is probably the highest it's ever been. And the one thing that we've worked on for years that we're probably pretty standard and, and pretty um, normal construction were roads, schools, public buildings. And in the private sector, there were apartment buildings and, and houses, and it was pretty much like that for a long time. And then the graph on, and I'm not an economist, so I, I, don't, I don't pretend to be one, but, but you know, the graph on the economy has kind of gone like this, and, it, and it's a little bit shaken as well because it's not as stable as we'd hope. Um, but the demand is there. And so we've never really had a demand for this much health care. And, and we haven't had a demand for even the road infrastructure that we're into. Population growth. Uh, we have a joint regional transportation agency we created to look at transportation needs in the region of HRM and outside of HRM. So we're in a really different environment. So on the healthcare, if we can get to a position that we can show the industry that we're going to be building more hospitals, um, whether it's at the HI project, Cobbequid, Dartmouth, expansions to other parts, and we create an actual economy and a create an actual industry here, I think that becomes a, a really quite more collaborative. And to my colleagues here, they can see how to get the, the skills that we need to do that, and they can get the people through the schools that we need. And, and um, uh, MLA Ince mentioned about going into the classrooms as well. It's if you know that there is going to be a health care uh, component that's going to go on for years, that we're going to do health care work, you can get kids interested because there's going to be a future for them. And then, and then that way they'll be there for the attorney and also brings our prices down and it also gives us a good product. So I think we're just on the cusp right now of, of working with the industry uh, to be innovative on, on the healthcare delivery. And I think if we, you know, with our client at Health and Health Authority looking to the future of healthcare, I think we're on a really good spot uh, to bring collaborative and innovative ways to deliver healthcare in this province going forward. Mr. Soho, you have a quick comment you'd like to make? I do, thank you. Yes, I'd just like to add to that. Uh, around the uniqueness and, and the, oper the, the innovative aspect of these projects, communication has been in increasingly um, growing with, the, with uh, Deputy Hackett's team. Industry and the departments are communicating very, very closely on these major infrastructure projects. The requirement, though, for apprenticeship on these projects is innovative. The requirement for diversity on these projects is innovative, and that is something that we are very proud of and should be very proud of in this province. Thank you. MLA Ince with about three minutes to go. Thank you. Um, we have heard from stakeholders that one of the challenges has been keeping students in the programs. Uh, the, um, and finding, they're finding that those students that they are working with or support leave the program before it's complete. So I was just wondering if Mr. Burr or Ms. Sesblay, if anyone could speak to that. Mr. Bureau? Yeah, as Minister, uh, Deputy Minister Zappale said, it's, it's even in our world, it's fine to recruit somebody, but they leave at Christmas, then that's not necessarily a success. Um, so we spend considerable time on retention, and retention or lack thereof can occur for many reasons. Um, a family issue, uh, we've had people who have um, had their brakes gone in their car and that expense at that moment in time is too high for them. So we talk a lot about wraparound supports. How do you support somebody from the classroom door out? And that classroom door out support is student services, 
Um, it's everything from mental health assistance to urgent aid is a term that we use to provide whether it's food or a, a hot water tank who's, who's gone. So the key is, is to allow students to be aware that those options are available. Um, when a student leaves for a reason that they don't want to leave, because some students will leave a program for the right reasons, and that's perfectly fine. But for a student who leaves a program because of a hardship, if we can't capture that before it happens, then nobody wins. The student's self-confidence goes down, there's an empty seat that continues in that program all the way along, and the market does not receive that unit of human capital that's required to help the economy grow and prosper. So when you talk about um, education now, there's a tremendous effort um, on that, wor that R word of retaining that student for the right, for the right reasons. Yeah. Emily Ince, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you for that. I've seen it in your shipbuilding program, your women's programs, and so it's nice to hear that it is expanding. Thank you. Emily Young, you have 30 seconds. Oh my gosh. In 30 seconds, can you talk about some of the uh, work around the fishery with NSCC? Mr. Bureau. <clears throat> Obviously, the fishing sector in Nova Scotia is a very large, important sector for us. <clears throat> it's an industry which is um, in need of highly skilled labor. Our Nautical Institute, our School of Fisheries are two um, areas, and I know our Dean, Tom Gunn, is working in a very progressive way to even modernize that more, to look at the marine sector in general and look at the many opportunities often overlooked by our youth who think a career in the ocean sector is on, a, on the back of a fishing boat, which is a great career, but it's much broader than that. Thank you very much. Uh, so that concludes our question and answer period. Thank you all members for uh, the great questions and thank you our witnesses for uh, you know, one, one, all the great answers and a great dialogue here this afternoon. Uh, before we leave, I'd like to ask any of our uh, panelists here if they'd like to deliver any closing remarks. So Deputy Minister Zappale, we'll start with you. Look, thanks, for, thanks for the great conversation on a really <laughs> critical topic. Um, it's been recognized around this table today uh, and elsewhere that Nova Scotia is experiencing rapid growth and we're committed at LSI to growing our province to 2 million people by 2060. We know that goal is bold um, and we're focused uh, on attracting and retaining newcomers who will help us meet our labour market needs and grow our economy. And we're also committed to connecting our youth here in Nova Scotia to employment opportunities right here at home, um, particularly our equity deserving communities. And we want skilled workers to know that they have a bright future in Nova Scotia where they can work to build their lives and contribute to their incredible growth our province is experiencing. Nova Scotia isn't alone in facing gaps in our labour market. We will continue to work across government, work with partners and communities to find solutions to challenges. Labour Skills and Immigration, which also includes the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency, um, we're, la we're laser focused on finding jobs for people and people for jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Minister Hackett. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for having uh, myself and my uh, team with me here today and, and uh, uh, the colleagues at this table to talk about this important item on, on skills and, and labour shortages. Um, you know, it's, it is a, a challenging time for us in the department and, and to be able to deliver projects to the province of Nova Scotia, but we do, uh, we do the best we can. We're very innovative and uh, we, do, uh, we do pretty much complete everything we start and we do a great job of it. Uh, we take pride in doing that. Um, but, it, you know, it is, a, it is challenging. But I just want to make sure that people understand that it is an exciting time as well. Um, it's a time for growth in the, in the province. Uh, we've had some really great opportunities, really great projects out there. Um, it's a time when I think this province has never seen this type of uh, growth before and, and the economy and some of the great things that uh, the folks at NSC are doing, the folks at Labour are doing. Uh, it's challenging, but it's but it's also exciting, and I think it's uh, it's something that uh, you know we we as a department are are looking forward to those challenges going forward. And uh, just thank you to everyone here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bureau. Any comments? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I want to extend that arrow of gratitude. Uh, thank you for welcoming us into your world to have this very important conversation, and and welcome to our world. I think mm. collectively, this is what we think about uh, morning, afternoon, and evening. The notion of um, accessing an education that will prepare you to build the economy and quality of life of Nova Scotia, I'm proud to say is that it's a collective agenda 
that we have in the province. And as I traveled across the country, I'm proud that when I come to a group like this, we may have um, people from different um, groups, but I think collectively we're all committed to serving the province in the best possible way that we can. I'll just finish off by saying that we're proud as a college, so we have 17 locations. 96% of the population of Nova Scotia lives within a half an hour's drive of an access point of NSCC. So we see the entire province as our market. So thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Sohol, any closing comments? Yes, thank you. And, and again, thank you for the invite to, to be part of the committee or join the committee today. I really appreciate that. Uh, at, at the Apprenticeship Agency, we are very unique. Um, as a government sort of body, we are industry-driven and industry-led. And so I'd like to really highlight that that is what, make our, what makes our Apprenticeship Agency unique. Um, these generational projects, they really do provide a platform of opportunity for this province. And I, and I, and I really want to share and, and highlight, and I mentioned this earlier, it's an opportunity for us to procure better, to invest back in our Nova Scotians better, uh, to, as an opportunity to advance our apprentices uh, and help them complete their apprenticeship journey on these projects. This is a real big opportunity for us to see our workforce of tomorrow built here in Nova Scotia. Uh, which th with that, I would like to echo that this is an exciting time. Um, I've been in the sector now for over 17 years and I've never felt the excitement as I do today in talking to employers, labor organizations, our training partners and our, and our provincial partners. And uh, very much again, want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And thank you to all of our guests uh, who've been uh, sitting here this afternoon. Well, uh, wonderful to see you all. Uh, so that concludes our meeting. And I think what we'll do is we'll have a two to three minute recess just to allow for our guests to leave the room before we begin our committee business. So thank you once again. We're in recess. <laughs>
order. So we'll uh, carry on with our committee business. Uh, just a few notes here I have received from the clerk. Uh, the first topic is our witness for February 28th meeting on support for firefighters. There's just some clarification of Michael Sears role with the Halifax Professional Firefighters Association, IAFF Local 268. The motion passed in this topic specified Captain Brendan Meher, 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 and or Michael Sears, Vice President. Uh, Mr. Sears is at present a member of this organization, but he does not hold a board position. The current president and vice president of the Halifax Association, Captain Brendan Mahar and Joe Triff, are not available for the February 28th meeting, but they have said that they're happy to have Mr. Sears represent them. Uh, they note that Mr. Sears is the Halifax Association's representative of the Atlantic Provinces Professional Firefighters Association, where he holds the position of Nova Scotia vice president. Uh, so as for comments or discussion, it really doesn't require any action from us since Mr. Sears was already uh, an approved witness uh, for the topic, uh, but I just wanted to uh, clarify his title, uh, just for the record, in case any member has any concerns about it. So no discussion from there, We're all in agreement that Mr. Sears is good to go. Okay, thank you. The other topic of discussion, uh, just to have a, a brief uh, conversation about, uh, is after the last meeting, some members spoke informally about the possibility of moving this committee's regular meeting time to afternoons to make travel easier. Uh, the clerk has advised that the committee calendar has an open afternoon space on the first Tuesday of each month. Uh, community services meets in the morning, so human resources could meet on that afternoon, the first Tuesday of each month. When the House is sitting, the committee could do what it does now, holds brief meeting in the morning just to consider agencies, boards and commissions, and there'd be no conflict with community services committee on those days because it doesn't meet during the House sittings. Meeting earlier in the month has a further advantage if some event, such as a snowstorm, forces a meeting cancellation. It'll be easier for, to reschedule a new meeting in time to meet the committee's mandate to meet at least once each calendar month to approve ABC appointments. Uh, the committee's approval of ABC appointments is just one step in a long process, so the clerk asked staff in the Executive Council office whether they can accommodate such a change. They have said they can as long as they have at least three months notice. Uh, so if the committee agrees today to start meeting on the first Tuesday after the afternoon of the month, the clerk can arrange for the change to take place in May. So those are some notes uh, some uh, for discussion uh, throughout there. There was an informal co conversation last meeting. So, you know, I could just put it out there. Is there any comments on uh, that last topic we, I just discussed? Emily oh, oh, McDonald. Uh, I, I, I'm fine with it. I mean, the three months is, if that's what it takes for them to be prepared, that's fine. Um, I would propose the meeting be one to three on those days, if that's, and that way, like I said, if when the house is sitting, it'd be 10 in the morning, because really that's when it would have always been before. Um, just like to see if that works for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Emma Lyons. Listen, folks, I'm in agreement with whatever you want to do. I'm in the city and I'm, you know, I don't have the same challenges most. So whatever you wish to do, I'm in agreement. So if there's no discussion, we don't really have to put the motion. Do we have general agreement that uh, the committee is uh, open to changing our meeting to the first Tuesday of each month between 1 and 3 p.m., unless we're in the House? Okay. So we don't need a motion or general agreement. So if uh, that is said, is there any other business? So seeing no other business, the next date of our uh, next meeting is February 28th uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. The topic is support for firefighters and the witnesses, as we discussed, with the Halifax Prof Professional Firefighters Association, IAFF, Local 268, the Department of Labor, Skills and Immigration, and Fire Service Association of Nova Scotia. So with that, do I have a call for an adjournment? Motion meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, committee.